very short presentations, um, and from there would like to move on to discussion. Uh, and we're hoping to um, have you leave here with uh, some data and some information, uh, some models, but most importantly, some things to think about in your own work and your own community. Uh, my name is Deborah Garcia Y. Griego. I'm the executive director of the City of Santa Fe Arts Commission. Hi, my name is Bria Heidelberg. I'm a professor of arts management and an independent consultant. Is this thing on? Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Hung Yuli Krakauer. I'm the executive director of the Queens Council on the Arts, and it's fabulous being here with all you people. And uh, Kenny Allen was scheduled to be uh, part of this presentation, but he was unable to join us. So um, apologies if you were here for rock star Kenny. Hopefully we'll make up for him. <laughs> um, and with that, we're going to have uh, Bria kick off. Um, can you make it your PowerPoint now? No, I'll close it. Uh, with her presentation, which I think is going to give us a solid background in her research on the subject of emerging leaders. Okay, well, now I'm up here, so fine, I'll just stay up here. Uh, so, widening the leadership pipeline, that's really loud, so I'm now going to move back. No, we need it loud. Stay loud. Okay. Stay loud. <laughs> <laughs> widening the leadership pipeline, um, the need for purposeful, important word, human resources practices in small and mid-sized nonprofit arts organizations. I focus on those because those are the ones that are often forgotten. Um, this is the overview that Clay provided me with. He was like, this is what you're going to do. And I said, okay. So these are the things that I'm going to touch upon. Respectful work environments, succession planning, uh, embracing demographic differences, pulling in the best talent, nurturing relevant organizations, and placing art at the center of communities. There's gonna be some like bad news, some medium news, but we'll start off with um, some positioning of myself because I'm a qualitative researcher. I also do some quantitative work, but I do believe that positioning yourself is important. So I came up through arts, and manage, arts management education, um, and now I am filtering all of that knowledge through uh, a second master's in human resource development through the psychology department at Villanova University. So I'm bringing my interest in arts and purposeful organizations to um, a predominantly for-profit focus at Villanova, but they've been really nice about helping me figure out ways to shift methodologies and understanding not only to a nonprofit context, but a nonprofit arts context. And why that's, why that's different is because most nonprofits have the ideas of providing public good or public value and also making sure that their organizations are financially sustainable. In the arts, we also have an eye towards artistic practice and artistic excellence. And, you know, as a person in this body, I've also been the token, the only, the forgotten minority where people say, oh gosh, I forgot you were black, and I didn't mean to say that. Um, so some of that <laughs> comes into play as well. Some good news, um, one of the hardest tasks that many nonprofit broadly defined organizations must do is get buy-in for people that are coming to work in a nonprofit organization or a human services organization. Um, they have to get buy-in to the mission. Most people that are working in our field self-select into organizations where their values are shared from an idea of artistic practice and the power that the arts have. So that is one issue that nonprofits broadly defined tend to encounter that we in the nonprofit arts tend to largely be able to ignore. People believe in the transformative you know, power of the arts and that's why they are engaging in the field as arts managers, so yay. Take that as a given. So I'm just going to jump into some things that um, are important to consider in the small and mid-sized uh, nonprofit context, arguably the nonprofit arts context in general, that we don't tend to see often. Job analysis would be one of those things. And this is the process of understanding, tracking, analyzing what each individual in your organization does. This can sometimes be time consuming but it is so worth the effort. You know that you have people that are and or positions, right? So there are many organizations that have a marketing and development associate, associate or a general manager that also does the education programming sometime. It's very important that you know how much of their time is actually dedicated to what tasks. 
It is through this process, whenever I work with arts organizations, that they find out that their engagement person actually spends 30% of their time in finance work. Or the fact that their general manager spends most of their time navigating parents in their education, in their education wing. Um, and so they're not doing, or they're not giving their full attention or the attention that, they, that you think they might be to all of the tasks that they are assigned. Um, it's also important to know who is doing what. So somebody might have a title, but somebody else might be supplementing their work and doing part of what you think goes under this other title. Um, for job-related reasons, job analysis is really important because it helps you identify gaps, overlaps, and needs for staffing purposes. And on the personnel side, it helps you identify the strengths, weaknesses, and task personality fit. If somebody tends to have a position, let's say, in development, but most of their work gravitates towards marketing, you have to ask yourself, is that because I, as an, or we as an organization, or I as a manager have pushed them that way, or are they self-selecting that way, and do we need to have a staffing change or a position or a title change? Job analysis also helps you build capacity. Um, this is a way to identify uh, ways to give and manage stretch assignments. How many of us know what stretch assignments are, have done stretch assignments before? Okay, so stretch assignments are when you give a lower level is not a nice term, a lower level staff member, um, a task that asks them to stretch their capacity beyond their traditional job title or beyond the skill sets that they have been exhibiting before. It helps them build new skills, it helps them reach new networks, um, but they can be difficult to pick, right? So you have to pick a stretch assignment that's going to work to give them a little bit of safe space to fail that won't, you know, tank your organization. Um, but you also have to manage the stretch assignment. And so that can be difficult to navigate, but it's a very important thing as people build capacity, not only for themselves, but for their organization. Another thing about building capacity is that we have this issue um, with the mid-level arts manager. So if you look at any given job bank, you will see positions, uh, entry-level positions, and you will see executive director positions. You very seldom, if ever, see mid-level management positions advertised in the arts. Um, but that goes against the general rules of thumb of management, that nobody should manage more than seven people, and that comes from for-profit. So the assumption there is that you're not managing more than seven people in the same function area. So say you have a very large organization and you have seven development associates, once you hire an eighth development association associate, you need another person at the management level to make sure that everybody is engaged and getting what they need and that the management structure can stay sound and in place. There is a growing body of literature that suggests that this number is significantly lower if you are managing people across different function areas. And as many of us in arts organizations know, most managers are managing people across different function areas. You're managing your marketing person, your development person, your, your finance person. So your capacity to manage and actually nurture and help these people grow is limited. So if you have more than like three or four people that you're managing across areas, there's a lot of space for human error in the management process. We also tend to suffer a lot from micromanagement. So this is a direct result of founder syndrome. Um, people thinking, well, people knowing that these organizations are their babies. They birth them through their ears, and their blood and sweat and tears and all that good stuff. So it's very hard to give that up to somebody else. That means that your organization is not building capacity. What it really is, is a line on somebody's resume as they come in, manage whatever it is that they can manage for those two years, and when there's no room to grow, they leave. Right? So your organization's capacity or the things that it can do never progresses. Um, and this is part of the need for a field-wide sort of altruistic perspective to arts management work. Your organization might just be a place where entry-level arts managers are groomed and build their capacity and in order for them to move up, they must move on. That is totally fine, but a lot of people have this um, innate aversion to thinking of the arts management ecology as one collective unit in which people can navigate different jobs and move around. Succession planning. So mid-level arts careers, again, 
necessary yet missing link. This is the space where people would learn the skills or begin to develop the skills that they would need to step into these executive director roles that everybody keeps saying are going to become available in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, depending on what year you heard, first heard that <laughs> statistic. Um, it's coming. Uh, so when it does, will, these pe will there be people available to step into these roles? Maybe, but we need some mid-level positions in the field in order to allow people the capacity to build these strengths up. Um, knowing that when it comes to succession planning, we tend to automatically assume the default is executive level succession planning. Succession planning needs to happen at all levels. Um, with the understanding that the person that might be the best fit in the next iteration of leadership doesn't necessarily have to be a replica for the person that is in the position right now. We run into this issue a lot when it comes to succession planning because people want to see a mini version of themselves taking over the helm. But as we know, most of us know the leadership, uh, the leadership, the lifestyle, lifestyles of the rich and famous just popped into my head. I guess it's the chandelier. Life cycle, there's the word. The life cycle of nonprofit arts organizations or nonprofit organizations in general means that your organization looks different at different points in that cycle. It's reasonable to assume that the leadership necessary at those different points in the life cycle might also look a little different over time. So succession planning should be in alignment with your strategic plan. What is the organization gonna face in the next three to five years? If any of these people in a leadership position or in our mid-level positions, if you have them, or even our um, entry-level positions, leave. If any of these people leave in the next three to five years, what is our plan for replacing them? These are things that should be happening as a part of the strategic planning conversation. All of these issues directly relate to embracing diversity in arts organizations. So it's sort of like um, they did the research once a lot of the subway systems became ADA compliant. They actually helped everybody, people that were traveling with luggage, uh, new mothers uh, traveling with strollers. If you help somebody, you're probably gonna help everybody, right? So if we're embracing um, demographic differences in our hiring and retention practices, we're not just gonna help on a racial issue, we'll help with age, we'll help with sexuality, we'll help with all these other identities that are traditionally underrepresented in arts management, especially at the executive leadership levels. Values are always nice. It is always wonderful to hear people say that they value and embrace diversity. I would actually rather see it. So I am the first woman of color in my department at uh, the university where I teach. Um, I'm also the only woman in the department. I know that my double minority status, oh, I'm also left-handed, so I know that my triple minority status um, is a large part of the reason why I was hired. They had an initiative, they wanted to hire somebody, fine. It's just a bonus for them that I'm really good at my job, too, right? So if, if that's what you need to get the process started, then fine, but get the process started. Um, this one way of doing that is being, acknowledging, and supporting first allies. Uh, Chris Rock has this hilarious joke um, where he talks about how people were surprised that Barack Obama was the, the first black president and how, you know, how he must be so qualified. And he was like, yeah, he's probably qualified, but this is just the nicest white people have ever been in history, right? There has to be a first ally in order for diversity to take place at these traditionally uh, homogenous organizations. And when you have somebody on the board or on staff that identifies themselves as that first ally, and that can be as, sm as simple or as small as somebody saying, maybe we should talk about diversity. That's your first ally, latch on, empower them, and try to get more people like that within your organization. Build your network as organically as possible with a broad range of diverse people regardless of whether or not they're in the arts or the nonprofits or whatever, um, because that is the space to get out your first stupid question, right? Which is okay, those stupid questions happen. I know that me personally, when I know that somebody's being super sincere, that gives you a little bit of slack to ask your first stupid question about how to recruit, retain, 
a diverse population for your arts organization and or your board. Questions you shouldn't ask though. Um, isn't it even racist to be talking about hiring a diverse staff, recruiting a diverse board? These are questions that I've actually heard in my consulting practice. So isn't it racist to even be talking about race? No. Like, <laughs> I don't know what else, don't know what else to tell you about that. Uh, no, it's actually racist to not be having that conversation. Um, are we concerned about giving up quality to increase diversity? Can anybody tell me what the underlying problematic assumption with that question is? <laughs> right, the underlying assumption that if you're diverse, then you're not qualified. Um, how can we hire, place whatever you like there, when they can't do the thing that anybody that's trained can be reasonably expected to do? Oh, we saw this play out not too long ago. Did everybody follow that, uh, the, the NEA conversation with the executive director of a music organization that said that people of color traditionally can't play piano, and so that's why we don't really incorporate them into our organization or, uh, you know, whatever. That was the comment du jour. Um, so this happens in our field. The underlying assumption, again, being that people can't do things that they are trained to do. Um, and my personal favorite, I knew, talked to, hired, tripped over this type of person before and it didn't work out. Um, two things, one, that's not a question. And <laughs> two, so what? Um, the benefit of the doubt is racist, as Larry Wilmore once said. Uh, so the assumption that if you have one experience with this one type of identified person means that you now have complete and utter knowledge of any other type of person that even remotely associates in that same identity group is, well, it's problematic, but like base level is just stupid, right? So don't do that. Ways to address some of these issues. So employee recruitment, 80% of jobs are given to somebody that is known. Right. Um, ways that you can be known, academic programs, internship opportunities, still very privileged spaces, right? So you have to be able to um, afford not being paid. And for most, I'm an internship coordinator, so for most programs you do have to pay for the semester that you're on internship. Um, there are some, so there's a lot of misconceptions about that, and I know that it's problematic for a lot of people. I know on my end the reason why you are required to pay for internship is because paying the university for those credits means that you're covered under the university-wide um, insurance plan. So if anybody touches that student where their bathing suit covers or they trip and fall or something unfortunate happens to them on the job, the only way that they can seek um, some sort of action is because they're under that insurance plan. The other thing is any internship program that's worth its salt is going to have somebody, in my case it's me, um, that vets the position, checks in with you as an organization, requires the student to have a midterm and final evaluation. There are purposeful management practices that should be happening with your intern and with your internship program. So for those of you who like having interns, want to have interns, make sure that you're ensuring that that happens because this is practice, I found, for both the student and the organization. So the student is learning how to engage in the evaluation process, coming in, sitting down, having a midterm and final evaluation, learning how to receive feedback and give feedback. But for younger arts organizations who maybe don't have a lot of staff that they manage, it's also training for them how to conduct a, an evaluation, how to provide critical feedback, how to set up a plan for somebody to go from point A when they start their internship to the end point at the, at the tail end of their internship. So this is really important. All right, back off my tangent. Volunteers and social circles. Again, these tend to be privileged spaces. You only recruit volunteers that are usually in your social circle or the social circle of people that are already connected to your organization. What this means is that, go back a couple slides, start to build your network as organically as possible, but build your network so that all of this stuff under the 80% is inherently diverse. If you have a diverse set of people in your inner circle of people at your arts organization, then by extension, when they're recruiting from their social circles, the work is being done for you, essentially. 
But the other half, those 20% of jobs, are given based on position descriptions and interviews. As a field, y'all, <laughs> friends. Let's work on our position descriptions, please. Um, abstract position objectives. Somebody that just went and got everything in the kitchen sink was just like, throw it in there, throw it in there. Maybe we'll get lucky, who knows? Maybe, maybe they'll be able to do all those things. Just, just put it in there, it's cool, it's cool. Um, the main problem with that is that traditionally speaking, men will apply to anything that they think that they are remotely qualified for. Women will not. So if you have, if your job is really five bullet points of things and you put 10 bullet points in there and a woman is qualified for those four out of those top five that you really wanted, she, statistically speaking, will not apply to your job. You just missed out. Um, yes, women have to work on, you know, having the, the self-esteem of a mediocre man, which, <laughs> but on the other end of that, we gotta meet people halfway, right? Um, you wanna have very clear language. You wanna avoid exclusionary language. You wanna be code specific. So if you're trying to recruit from a specific population, you need to actually talk to some of those people and understand what the codes are. So for example, um, I grew up in Pittsburgh where we say pop and yins and whatever have you. I moved across the mountains and I live in Philadelphia now. I say soda now. Um, but on a, deeper, on a deeper level, when you, growing up in Pittsburgh, if you said, oh, where are you from? People say a section. Pittsburgh is a collection of suburbs, right? So if you say the West End, everybody knows what you're talking about, that's good enough. In Philadelphia, it's a more specific code because it's a collection of neighborhoods. So you say your neighborhood and then people can identify whether or not you're a transplant or how long you've been there if you mention the cross street immediately after. So my husband will say, I'm from West Philly. Oh, 58th and Thompson. And if you don't do that, that's enough of an indicator that you're not in a name group. It's something very small that you can reach a different type of population with if you know what those specific indicators are that identify that you have an organizational culture that is a friendly space for whoever it is that you're trying to reach. Again, over ambitious requirements. Um, if you believe that your position requires a degree, by all means, put it in there explicitly. What I'm finding in my research, I've been looking at position descriptions for two years now, is that um, people do not put a degree in the requirements, but when they're looking at resumes, it's an implicit bias and they are checking for it. If you're gonna check for it, just put it in there, fine. Um, but if the position really doesn't require the degree, then don't do it. Degrees are still, I mean, I'm an arts management educator, yes, please, come to our programs. But it's, it's exclusionary sometimes, so be on the lookout for that. Years of experience, does somebody really need seven years of experience for your entry level position? Do they? Um, and the task, again, don't throw everything in there that your organization needs done. Be very purposeful and specific about what task should go under that position description or that position title that you're calling for. Don't ask illegal questions, even as a joke, because all jokes have some truth behind them. So are you starting a family soon? Illegal, stop, no. Um, <laughs> are you married? No, just stop, illegal. Um, make sure that your interview questions and techniques give you information you need to make informed, decision, informed hiring decisions. Don't just Google interview questions. You know, if you need a development director, you should be asking questions that are specifically related to the development direction. I'm finishing up. Um, do you have a clear understanding of how this new position and the person that will be in it will fit into structures that already exist? Because this might also indicate some ways in which you need to, to go about conducting your interviews. And do your interview and assessment practices either intentionally or unintentionally cha champion hegemonic norms? And what I mean by that is when you're in an interview room and you're looking at multiple candidates, do you think that the person that speaks the loudest and speaks the longest is necessarily the best person for the job because that's what we've sort of been trained to think about leadership or are you thinking about different leadership styles and what might be a fit? Retention, ensure that your internal appreciation is expressed both word and deed. Um, the biggest thing to take away from this is be able to have a consistent system of feedback. And if you're the type of person that can't handle honest feedback, set up mechanisms so that you can receive the information without putting your employees in an uncomfortable power dynamic, right? So 
If you know that you get angry, if the way you process information is anger first and then understanding, or if you're a crier first and then understanding, don't put that on the employee. That's not their, that's not their place to handle your emotions, right? Give them a safe space to offer feedback. Exit interviews, friends. Do them, do them, do them. Most people assume that they know why people left their organization and they're usually wrong. For small to mid-sized organizations, the most important thing is offering a space for people to answer honestly about why they're leaving the organization. If you have an executive director and three staff, that means that your executive director is not doing your exit interviews, your board is. Please take that to heart, it's very important. And as a bonus, before I finish up, intersectionality, people are multiple things. People are made up of multiple experiences. Just because you have somebody that represents this box to you, doesn't mean that you've gotten the whole swath of the lived experience of somebody in that particular body. I was asked on numerous occasions to head up uh, after school programs for at risk inner city uh, little girls and teach them dance and like to handle the issues of what being in an underserved, under you know, um, underfinanced public school. I went to a predominantly Jewish private school. I'm useless in that context, but they looked at me and assumed that I, that I would know, right? So make sure that you're getting the understanding of everybody's lived experience and you're actually checking the boxes that you need to. I ran a little bit over, sorry, and I'm finished. Thank you, Bria, and it was an enjoyable overrun, so no need to apologize. Very useful information. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experience in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, and just a little bit of perspective, um, some census data. Uh, we're actually a very small community. Um, this is 85,000, so that includes um, some of the county, not all of it. <clears throat> we're a minority majority city as well. Um, but for a community of our size, we have this incredibly robust arts and cultural industry. Uh, we are known internationally for arts and culture. Um, <clears throat> so it is both the um, blessing and the curse of the work that I do, is how do you manage that kind of uh, uh, outlier kind of community. So here are just some statistics that when you think about this being a community under 100,000 are actually um, incredibly impressive. Um, so recently, um, we were lucky enough to host one of AFTA's new community vision convenings, and as part of that discussion, we were asked to stand in a circle and step forward and say the thing that was the greatest challenge in our own community. <clears throat> and one woman, and I'm gonna be very blunt here, an older, wealthy, white woman who is on the board of many, many of our major cultural institutions, stepped forward and made this statement that our greatest challenge is the revolving door in leadership positions at our cultural institutions. She then stepped back and another young man stepped forward. Um, he is relatively new to the community. He is in his 20s and he is uh, struggling to make ends meet. And this is what he said. Our greatest challenge is the lack of a revolving door in our cultural institutions. So I think to me that summed up really well the fact that um, a lot of this has to do with where you stand. And if you're standing on the inside of the revolving door, it seems like it's going really fast. Uh, but if you're waiting to get in, it can feel very slow. Um, so I wanted to drill down on this a little bit more, understand more about my community. And I want to be very clear that this is just a snapshot. I used um, historic data that we have as a grant maker about the people in our leadership positions over the past 15 years. Um, it's meant in no way to be in, um, in depth it really is just a, a view of um, what our leadership transitions actually look like in this very rich but very small community. Um, so in the past 15 years, out of our 32 largest cultural organizations, and just um, as a point of perspective, for Santa Fe, a large cultural institution, our largest is a $13 million budget. So these are not really in, in the scale of the arts world, the greater arts world, all that large. Um, there were 39 executive um, position changes so that's about 2.5 FTEs a year. Now it's important to point out that of these 32, or these 39, I'm sorry, 32 organizations, 11 had no leadership change whatsoever. And the data that I'm presenting here doesn't take into account um, 
the landscape of that leadership, but I will say it is predominantly white and male. Um, oh, well this is gonna make presenting data very hard. <laughs> So this is a comparison of, let me go back and see if it's gonna, yeah. Okay, so th what this chart basically shows you is um, the uh, leadership breakdown according to several categories, uh, male versus female, uh, racial and ethnic uh, diversity, and then also those under 40. And you can just look at the pie chart and understand that the biggest piece of the pie are white males over 40, the second biggest piece of the pie are females over 40, and the rest is everybody else. So um, this is just a comparison of um, female leadership uh, versus the general population. So in terms of women in leadership positions, we're actually doing fairly well in Santa Fe. However, this is, uh, as I mentioned, Santa Fe is a minority majority city. Um, so this is the general population on the right, or I'm sorry, your left. Um, the dark red representing minorities. The other one, the white, the green, <laughs> light green, um, again, just predominantly white. Um, so this is probably the most helpful considering all my data somehow magically went away. Um, basically, of the 12, 12 of the 39 hires went to somebody who was not white and over 40. So that's only 30% of our hires. Um, <clears throat> Nine went to those who represented some sort of racial and ethnic diversity. Five went to people under 40. And only two went to diverse under individuals under 40. And you're looking at one of them. Um, so really the, the, it, the analysis is our leadership pipeline is very small and it's very white. Um, so what are some of the things that the community is doing to try to address these leadership issues. So the first is kind of formal pipelines, and I think many communities have these kind of programs. Um, one that was recently started was the Emerging Social Leader Sector um, Program. Uh, this was a really interesting um, group of people that went through a three-month training period. Uh, they came to meet once a month. They did learning circles, some professional development, but what was really interesting was um, what was um, they paired a group of mentors, I was one, with their um, emerging social sector leaders. Um, and at the end of every day, uh, we had what's called drive-by consulting. So essentially, all of the mentors sat in chairs around the room. All of the emerging leaders could come around and bring an issue to you. The thing was, is that all of the mentors were told not to solve the problem. We were taught how to coach people through the problems. And um, I can say over the course of sessions, you get to know people. Um, so I think this was an interesting approach. I also like the fact that it was uh, cross-sector. It wasn't just the arts. So there were a lot of people from the arts because that's where a lot of our uh, social sector is, but there were also people from other fields. So it allowed participants to make connections not only with um, their mentors, but also with um, their peers in other fields. Um, Leadership Santa Fe is a very well-established program. Uh, it's something that's sort of a mark uh, in the community of somebody who's up and coming, and I, you know, I think to some extent it does um, impact hiring decisions, saying that you've been through this program. Um, I'm simply gonna state these pictures, which I pulled up their website, says something about the diversity or lack thereof of their participants. But another component that they do that I think has a lot um, more depth in terms of reaching to the community is their youth program. So they have a mirror to their adult program for their youths, for youths, and by youths that is uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Um, the majority of participants come from public high schools in Santa Fe. Um, and as a frame of reference, 75% of Santa Fe public school students are on free and reduced lunch, and one in four are technically homeless. So this is an underserved population that they are reaching. Um, they go through an eight-month course, Saturday meetings. Uh, they meet with civic leaders in the morning and discuss issues. And then in the afternoon, they actually go out and do some types of rope course and other training. Um, and what's a fascinating aspect of this is that students who complete this course actually get three college credits. And so I think for many of these students, it may be their first introduction into the capacity to go to college and what the college experience may be like and to get some credit before they even leave high school, I think begins to um, create a pathway for students who might not otherwise have that. Um, 
the other really interesting program that um, the George O'Keefe Museum is doing and has been doing uh, since they opened in 1998 is the Georgia O'Keefe uh, Art and Leadership Program for Girls. So using O'Keefe as um, a figure for both um, artistic practice and uh, women in a field, they uh, take these girls through a series of summer programs. Um, it's been so successful, they've actually started it for boys too, which I think is a really nice addition. Um, in a recent discussion with Rob Krett, their director, he has a vision for how this should be tying into other opportunities that they have. Uh, and Bria talked a lot about the problem, the inherent problem with internships um, and, and the cost of going away for an internship, the cost of paying for the credit hours. Rob Krett and his education department are really working to align their art and leadership program, which is basically um, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, with then high school internship opportunities, which are essentially mentorships that work with the leader, girls' leadership program up through college internships and in then even their academic fellows. So they run a really robust academic fellows. It's traditionally uh, post-grad work. Um, but historically, those individuals have come in from outside the community and been very isolated from the work in Santa Fe. They hide and they do their research. And Rob really sees an opportunity to bring them more dynamically into the community as well as to encourage a pipeline that would actually take a girl through. So I think long term it'll be interesting to see how many girls move through this. He was able to give me some examples of two who got to the undergrad internship level. So I think that um, for a major cultural institution that's a lot of leadership. What I'm actually seeing in Santa Fe is frustration um, from younger emerging leaders about this lack of turnover and lack of, of uh, opportunity and creating alternative pathways building their own pipelines, building their own leadership um, opportunities. And I see that through collective action. So um, Mix Santa Fe is um, really more of a for-profit group, um, but they do a lot of research around young people in Santa Fe, what they need. They have monthly mixers and they drill down on one data point. Um, I think this one may be about a maker space they were working on developing. Um, and those kind of opportunities can actually be very hard to come, for, come by in Santa Fe, to just get together with your colleagues over a cocktail in a new space and talk about the projects that you're working on and where you, you might have synergy. Um, Strangers Collective is a, a group of young artists in Santa Fe who were frustrated by the lack of opportunities to exhibit their work, and they actually started um, salons in someone's living room where they would come together, they'd bring the work that they were writing on, they work in both the visual and literary arts, um, and they would share it in somebody's living room. And it's grown to the point now that um, they've had exhibits at the David Richards Gallery, which is um, a fairly well-established contemporary gallery in Santa Fe. They've had it at our own uh, community gallery. And they're really moving out into uh, the greater Santa Fe community, providing these opportunities for young artists to show their work, share their work, and collaborate. And then um, one that's getting a lot of national attention is an organization called Meow Wolf, which was an artist collective that started eight years ago. Um, there are a couple of key individuals in leadership positions, but there's over 120 artists who actively participate in, um, they're known for interactive art installations. And they most recently opened an exhibit called the House of Eternal Return, which is in a bowling alley that George R. R. Martin from uh, Game of Thrones purchased and leased for them. Um, so they've really uh, developed um, an interesting business model that is based on a mix of for-profit and non-profit and entrepreneurship opportunities. And then they've also partnered with Make Santa Fe to create a maker space and Chimera to do an educational institution. So to me, these were just interesting um, as I said, interesting examples of young people finding and creating their own paths when um, the established cultural institutions weren't providing those opportunities. Um, I think for our community, a couple of things that are probably um, important for us to work on and shared by many communities, I think in terms of the city, which is who I work for, I think until our boards, commissions, and uh, committee memberships are more diverse, we're not gonna effectively create opportunities for people to move up the leadership pipeline within the community. Um, a key initiative the mayor is 
mentorships, internships, and apprenticeships so that young people who are facing incredible challenges in our community can find um, pathways not only to just employment, but we can retain young people in our community. Um, I think that the leadership of many of our cultural institutions is definitely reflective of a lack of board diversity and a lack of young people. And I think until um, our boards reflect that better, we're gonna have a hard time moving diverse people into leadership. Um, I recently heard somebody say that, you know, if you have one uh, diverse person on your board, it's a token. If you have two, it's a gesture. If you have three, then you're starting to make action. And I, I think that's probably true. Um, I think our cultural institutions also need to examine their hiring practices. A lot of the major cultural institutions obviously go to the high-end search firms and headhunters who go out and attract people with really um, impressive resumes, but not the most diverse pool of applicants. I think that default for how you find leadership is a real problem. And I was really um, in line with what Bria was talking about, practicing pipeline management. I think Santa Fe suffers from a zero-sum game. If I train somebody in a mid-level position up, if I pay for them to expand their skill sets, somebody is going to steal them from me. It's not in the long run going to benefit my organization. And I've seen that even, um, unfortunately, with some of my division directors within the city. I'm not going to pay for somebody to go get trained because they'll just leave me. And I think until we can view this as a community-wide issue and that it's in our best interest to um, bring people up and allow them the opportunity to move on, in fact, encourage it, I think we're gonna continue to see problems. And then I also do like this idea of supporting alternative pathways. So for me right now, um, one of our major functions is grant making, which of course, like many government funders, I require that somebody be a 501c3 and have three years of operating history underneath them. Um, that inherently cuts out a large group of people. Um, it feeds them up through a very traditional framework. And I think we as government funders need to be looking at ways that we can make our programs accessible um, to people who aren't on that path quite yet. So that's what I have. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Technical difficulties. Hi there. I'm Hung Yili Crack Gower. I'm from Queens, New York. Um, a lot of people ask me a lot about diversity, and I think I might be one of very few people on this planet that say, I don't have a problem with diversity because I cannot swing a dead cat anywhere in the borough of Queens and not hit diversity in the head a thousand times. And so um, the question of leadership has always been interesting to me because while I have diversity in spades, the leadership, the, wi the widening of the pipeline continues to be um, a challenge. And so I'm going to start by t saying that uh, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs issued a diversity survey made all of us totally nuts and crazy because we, fit, we feared there was a lot of punitive consequences to saying, yeah, we don't have diverse boards, we don't have diverse staff. Um, but the, one of the interesting facts that I will tell you is that in the city of New York, which is not a small town, ten per, um, the last 10 years of hiring in all of the major cultural institutions across the city, um, this has been the most diverse decade of hiring in the past 10 years. If you dig down a little deeper, you'll find that that 10 years is mostly junior positions. You're not going to find the curators at the Whitney. You know, this is not part of it. So um, uh, I drill down even further, because I'm just that kind of person. And I said, I want to know where they are. Like, where are these people in the last 10 years? And they're in the room. So in New York City, these people are in the room the diverse, young, emerging leaders. They're everywhere. And so, to me, 
I'm thinking, well, you're in the room. What I'm going to focus on is giving you the tools to play the game while you're in the room. Because if you're in the room and you don't have the words to speak, forget it. It's like going to the golf, uh, the golf tournament and not having the right bag of clubs. So you're in the club, but you can't play the game. Um, words have their roots in etymology. And language, the language of power, has its roots in privilege. So the people who speak the language of power speak it very fluently and confidently. Um, and exclusively, and they have determined meanings for the rest of us, whether we like it or not. So I'm here to say that I really kind of, um, you know, what Bree had said before about having the particulars. You know, when you can say, I'm from 58th and Thompson, you know, and you start to speak on a different level, people understand that you belong in that room. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. So young people who are in the room don't have that. They don't have that because nobody's taught them that. But more importantly, they haven't created it for themselves. So not long ago, I was on the arts um, panel for Indianapolis. Um, I sat on this panel, uh, read 54 different, um, different uh, applications. And I was very uh, curious to see how other states um, talk about excellence. And in a state like Indiana, it's very different than Queens, New York. So um, let's see, this, is this the button? Bear with me, this is really not my forte. I made a note of um, words that the panelists use to describe um, dance. This is all only about dance. And where we had um, ballet companies or tap dance companies and, you know, I noticed that we use these words on the left. Classic, technique, genre, excellent. When the Mexican Calpoli Dance Company came up, we, we spoke these words. Multicultural, folk art, regional, authentic. And I said, there's nothing in there that talks, there's no rhetoric of excellence in here. It's, it's like almost like under the vitrine, isn't that cute? It's like the other. It's the language of the other. Um, how many of you are from granting organizations? Okay, and how many of you have noticed? Okay, how many of you have? Okay, so how many of you have noticed this phenomenon? More or less. Um, again, this is a dance. This is from you know just ballet and um, you know folk arts. Uh, and I took notes, and we actually had drinks over this, and we all caught ourselves as being, a, you know, the perpetrators of something that we also want to not be perpetrators of, which is a clear indication that there's no language for this. There is, it's a self-imposed language, or um, the language of power. So I say that it is important for us as artists, grant makers, grant reviewers, half and half, we have to rewrite the language of power. Um, the one thing that I really believe in is junior boards. I have a fabulous junior board. There are 13 firecrackers, and I've lost about nine of them already. Why? It's because I've taken them um, to Albany with me to uh, testify at budget testimony. I gave them a year of hell. I said, you, if you want to be a leader, you have to like come with me in the car. You know, you just have to just be with me. And um, they're now serving on boards throughout the Borough of Queens. And so, again, it's a community initiative. We are pulling up a community. They may not be my board members, but they will be board members for you. And that's important to me. So um, I believe that leaders like these leaders that I've um, said goodbye to recently, they need the language of power too. My friend Phil works for um, Ivy.com, and Phil is wild. Like he, he, he took dance classes from a friend of mine who was a uh, contortionist consultant for Cirque du Soleil, and Phil took that class. So he, in my mind, he's a rock star. <laughs> and he and I believe in um, uh, junior boards. And so this organization, he actually handholds um, young hedge fund designer, uh, uh, 
hedge fund uh, managers, and he says, I am focusing on building boards from the external side. And he said, you will be surprised at how many people do not know how to behave in those situations. And if they're from second generation like me, it's because my parents were working so hard, they never had time to go to the, ba the benefit or the gal. They had no uh, role model to actually uh, learn from. And so he says that without an organization like this that actually pairs them with, uh, to be in junior boards for the Met, the Whitney, all these big, humongous um, cultural organizations in New York City, they, they cannot develop the language. They cannot develop the confidence. They cannot, uh, the perception of themselves. They cannot define leadership in their own words. And he says to me, that is one of the most difficult things because they get in the rooms. They're standing next to Agnes Gund and they're like, they have no idea how to present themselves. Um, so the language of power is very important. Um, in this case, it's the language of leadership. Another area that I believe in is the uh, language of empathy. Um, I have a colleague named Lupita Gonzalez. And she and I sit on the Nonprofit Coordinating Committee of New York, which gives out the Gold Standard Award in New York for nonprofit management. And she recently did this webinar on uh, uh, microtransgressions and her self-care toolkit. Now let me ask you something. How many times have you been in a room where you've heard somebody say something to somebody and it just made you cringe because it was just, just not right? How many, how many of you, and okay, great, me too. How many of you have actually said something that once the words left your mouth, you wanted to cringe? <laughs> so I say this again because, in, because we need that language or we need the mindfulness that we are transgressors as well as victims. So according to Lupita, Microaggressions are social exchanges in which a member of a dominant culture says or does something often accidentally and without intended malice that belittles and alienates a member of a marginalized group. My mother, who is a closet Buddhist, she never professed that because she didn't want, you know, she didn't want to make a big deal of anything, but she just, when I showed her this, she said, in Cantonese, of course, you should just be nice to people, what's wrong with you? Right? Um, so that's how I interpret it. But uh, it, this is something that uh, crosses into a, um, I think, the most important sphere of language. Because this is where, in, the bra in your brain, in the interior cortex, someplace in there, where you process pain is also where you process empathy. So when you have a constant barrage of microaggressions, it wears down on you your empathy levels go down, you get sick, you get stressed out. Um, so this really is, I think, one of the most damaging things that we have to deal with, and this is what our leaders who work so hard to get into these rooms, they suffer from. And I think that the one thing that you can do is that you can speak. So this is why, to me, developing the language of empathy is the area that is not just for the leaders, it is for you, it is for me, it's for everyone to be more mindful of. Oh, this is the math that um, Lupita and I did. If you take the last census, there were 322,851,700, whatever that number is. And she says, the studies show that most people experience um, an average of 10 microaggressions per day. Now, if you do the math, that's a lot of microaggressions that are happening in the United States. And so it's in our fair country, um, which will in the year 2050 be that wonderful minority majority um, country, which I think is the stupidest sounding thing I've ever heard. But I'm gonna talk about that later because that's about changing the language of power. Anyway, the microaggressions produce trauma. So you're having a situation where you're gonna have a bunch of traumatic people walking around inflicting microaggressions upon each other um, unless we all take the universal responsibility of stopping it and as my Cantonese mother said, just be nice to people for crying out loud. So 
Um, this is a very interesting video that we um, shared at the Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, and it's how not to sound racist. It's on YouTube. It's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. But um, it do, the, he does have a lot of um, things to say in it that we really should be paying attention to. I'm sure you could find thousands of these on YouTube, but I put it up there just for you so that you could um, see it if you ever want to know how not to sound racist. So <coughs> to me, rewriting the language of empathy is part of the language of power. Um, so let me just say, let's, let's talk about you. Let's rewrite you. This is what we did in New York. Tom Finkelpearl, who's the, the uh, commissioner for the Department of Cultural Affairs, said to me the other day, um, well, by 2050, you know, America is going to be this minority majority society. And he said it in this big room with lots of fancy people. And I pulled him to the side later and I said, Tom, do you think that there could be a better way to say that? Isn't that the clunkiest, like hanging on the Titanic kind of term you could possibly think of? And don't people who belong to our future America, don't they deserve better than that? Don't they deserve um, a term that, that, that can actually grow with power, that, that you could be really proud of saying? Isn't that? And he goes, I know, I can't stand it. But we need to do something about it. So in Queens, what we do is we gather a lot of um, the emerging artists that I bring every year to Americans for the Arts, because I really love having them meet all of you. Um, Carlos Martinez, who I brought this year, I have not seen in three days, because he's been out of us. If you've seen Carlos Martinez, please tell him to call me. <laughs> I like to check in with him. Um, well, anyway, we um, gather a lot, and we have these uh, fishbowl things, and we decided to play microaggression Mad Libs. And what we did was, how many of you have ever played Mad Libs? Okay, you know, insert verb, noun, you know, adverb. So we did, we took Tom's sentence, and we said, we really don't like the way that sounds. So we took out that phrase, minority, majority, and we had this discussion, well, what word would you, what word would you put in it? And we made a list, say this, not that, right? Like that diet book, eat this, not that. So that's what I think you guys could do too. Like if there's a phrase or there's something that you hear that you really don't like or um, you think could be better, play microaggression Mad Libs. Just, you know, put the, the term in. So we were playing around with minority, majority and we got stuck on the word minority, and um, big surprise, right? So we were, we were thinking, well, what word would you use? You know, what would I be proud to say? What, what is something that would um, really fit the bill? And we, dis we dissected minority, majority, and I said, most of us felt that minority, majority was really an indication of um, a divisive thing. It was, dis it was static. It was negative, positive. It was all these terrible things. And we decided we wanted something that was inspirational. We wanted something that was um, more indicative of movement and, and uh, you know, something of the future. And so the conversations are still going on. We haven't redefined minority, majority. But I can tell you that those conversations are in almost every sector in Queens because when we do this, we don't just have a bunch of artists sitting at the table. We have bids, we have the film companies, we have everybody who's anybody in Queens at our table. And so this is what's, what I feel is the important work that we have to do to create the language of power. Um, and I'm gonna share with you the word that I like the best. It was ascendancy. So we tried that out. Well, Tom Finkelpearl, in 2050, America will be a society or an ascendancy society. Some people like it, some people don't, but everybody likes it a whole heck of a lot better than minority majority. Um, and so uh, I'm going to close by saying, like, I hope that you um, see it from my point of view, that it is really work that it's not just for one sector, for emerging leaders or current leaders or uh, practitioners, grantees. It is something that we as a society have to do and have to put our collective Mad Libs head, hats on together to create um, so that we can all own it. 
because it's going to define us. And if, uh, you know, the, the story is if you don't write your own story, someone else is going to write it for you. And so as we move into this new era where we have emerging leaders and we have these challenges ahead of us, let's be prepared by having the language at our fingertips, on the tips of our tongue, and language that we will be truly proud to say and use and see turn into a powerful tool that defines America as we want it to be. Thank you. Oh, that's me. Thank you, Hunyi. <clears throat> so I think in different ways what we've all talked about are um, inherent systems um, that inadvertently close the leadership pipeline. Um, is, is probably the best way to sum it up. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions or any conversation? There's a microphone right there and we'd ask that you use the microphone since this session is being recorded. My name is Susan Collings and I'm here in Boston as Executive Director at the Art Connection and I have two questions. One is in a very small three-person staff organization, when we're talking about providing opportunities, do you have any suggestions for a person who is doing her job well, but has been there 15 years? So there hasn't been an opportunity to kind of shake things up the way I might have liked. And then the other thing is, with respect to our board, I literally, in my first interview, somehow said this, and they still hired me, this is a wonderful, caring organization, but the board is too white and too old. And I meant it, and I proceeded to encourage the board to make efforts to have it reflect Boston in, in that particular year, 2010, but it's always been kind of a few steps forward, a few steps back. And so any creative strategies, and again, I absolutely believe in all of the things that you've mentioned because I don't want to be an all-white organization. Um, but sometimes for all the best intentions, it hasn't been easy to accomplish the goals that we've set out to accomplish. The other thing is when I had one staff position change and I made such an active effort at recruitment, each person that was a person of color took themselves out of the running because they were seeking $10,000 more than I was paying. And I just couldn't compete with that. So then the question is, do you hold the position open kind of indefinitely until you get that candidate that you're really seeking? Because that isn't effectual for the organization. So I've, I've thrown a lot of questions at you. So Bria, do you want to take a stab at the first question? And then Hunyi, I know from previous conversations with you, you definitely have some thoughts about the board. Um, so I've seen a lot of, is this on? Hello, yes it is. Um, I've seen a lot of success with, uh, it's sort of like the idea of wife swap, go with me, where, <laughs> <laughs> where two small organizations have somebody that's been in their position for a long time and they'll rent the person out to the other organization to give them a different experience, whether that be a different like arts discipline or a different function area experience, but they're both still working in their, their home institution, like that's what the, the pay structure doesn't change, but it's an opportunity for them to get out, build their network, do some, do some stuff outside of what they do regularly. And that requires, you know, a, another organization to partner with and a clear understanding of what that person wants to get out of it. But it's a way to sort of volunteer on your work time and, and get an additional experience rather than having to, after you leave your nine to five, then go do something, something else. Um, other opportunities such as sitting in on the board or offering them the opportunity to uh, shadow somebody in a different position uh, is, is another way to, to give people some additional experience outside of their, their regular function. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the board. Um, I, I think that you're, you're describing a situation that many of us have, uh, a board that we'd like to change. Uh, my first suggestion is to rewrite your bylaws and put in one year uh, renewable terms, but they have to be reviewed at the end of the each year. Then I would set up a very nice 
Advisory Emeritus Circle. Um, that's code for Elephant's Graveyard. And then invite them to join the, the very fancy you know, Emeritus Circle with an opt-in letter and say, thank you for your many years of, of uh, dedicated service. We really, really appreciate everything that you've had, have done. Um, and if they haven't paid their dues, fabulous then you could actually put that in there as well. Or if they've missed a meeting or two, and you can say, we would love to have you continue your service on our board at our Emeritus Gra Elephant Graveyard and have a lovely cocktail party for them. It must work for me. You will, you know, as you do it right. Um, and then uh, one by one, as you do that, you find somebody new to come on the board and assure them that their good service is going to be carried on by this new person. Works wonders. And is the fact that we haven't had great success with bringing on a younger, more diverse board because they may have felt a lack of fit with the existing people so that we'll have better success if the whole board becomes that as well? Absolutely. You kind of make it fun for them, you know? You have to give them Not even That's fun, but safe. Yeah. I look at organizations, and when I go in and there's not another person of color for miles and miles and miles, it makes you, you can build up a whole backstory about how it got to be that way, and it can be scary, and it might not even be the truth, but it's enough if you're not in the space to say, okay, I'm ready to be this token until the rest of the organization changes. And sometimes you do that, and. I'm doing it right now, sometimes you do it, um, but you, you have to want to do it, you have to be ready to do it because it takes, it takes a toll. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to make a comment about the last question and then um, ask one of myself, but I, I just Can wanted to- Can you step to, closer to the mic? Yes, I just wanted to counter the notion that um, people of color like anybody else um, don't take jobs that, you know, because of pay, I think people, take jobs and many people, I'm sure many people in this room, um, have taken jobs because of the challenge, because of the opportunity to do something that um, is part of your mission. And I hear that a lot, that's another myth, I think, and I'm not, it may be true in this case, but I, I, that, you know, oh, um, you know, we couldn't get a candidate because, you know, and it, that just counters, uh, people of color will work for way less than um, other, their, their counterparts. I just wanted to challenge that. But I guess one of the things I'm really frustrated about all the time, um, and I appreciate the conversation and the privileges, I thought that that was, but I guess one of the things that I am uh, frustrated by is that we just won't name it. I mean, I think the reality is, is that, um, and, you know, Tom Finkel Pearl, I think, and I lived and worked in Queens uh, for a while, I think that, um, what we probably, and I don't, what we're not naming is just that um, the racism is so pervasive that um, folks sometimes can't see candidates um, for what they bring to the table. And we were in another session where we were talking about embedded artists, and I remember as a writer, um, I was asked many, many years ago to do a, um, when I was really, when I was much younger, to do a, um, a ride along with a Tacoma uh, police officers because they were having a lot of issues with the community and one of the things that really fascinated me is the difference between um, what I saw and what the policemen saw the policemen that I was most of them were white men and they would see an uh, African-American person and they would describe the person oh he was 6'4 and 250 pounds and the person I saw was 5'9 and probably 160 pounds soaking wet and that really has influenced me because I've been on a lot of um, panels, um, hiring panels, where my perception about um, talent and qualification is so different from my peers. And, and it definitely applies to men and it definitely applies to age and it definitely applies to people of color. And so I just want to challenge it because I do think that, I don't think there should be any panel that should happen at any time where you don't have a diverse panel. If you don't have a diverse, if we don't have a diverse panel, I think that that just clouds our inability, our ability to see. And I think that if we have boards that are not diverse, so I just want to name it because we're going to be having this conversation for another 25 years, if we just don't talk about what's true, there is inherent bias. And I'm, not, and I'm not, I always say to myself, I'm a part of it too, because I grew up in the same world. So I have to challenge myself, even though, you know, I grew up in Watts. 
So I have to say to myself constantly, what am I seeing? And to make sure that I have people, if I'm working with young people, I have to have people on that panel or in that planning that are young. I'm talking about the high school level if we're talking mm -hmm. about high school. So how can we hire without having someone who is reflective um, of all of our communities and also how are we not tying the fact that we're, some of our cultural institutions are dying because we're acting, we're all like PC about it. I mean, righteously in the 21st century, there should be no hiring at all. And there should be nobody ha wringing their hands about um, the lack of board diversity. We're part of the problem if we continue to prolong these conversations. I think you're absolutely. <laughs> Um, so two things in response to that. Uh, one, the major issue with small and mid-sized organizations that I see is that a lot of the federal laws don't apply to you if you have less than four, between 12 and 15 full-time equivalent employees. So the legal systems that are, the legal structures that are in place to hold larger organizations accountable are not applicable in most of our contexts, which means that we have to self-police and that gets to, to what she was saying. The other thing is, um, when it comes to uh, recruiting younger or emerging leaders, um, the field is professionalizing and there are a lot more people that are getting the, the graduate degree in arts management, which means they're also getting that debt. And so while there is the consideration of taking a pay cut to take an opportunity that would be really great for you, sometimes you just, like the numbers have to work out because Sally Mae wants hers either way, either way. Um, so some things to consider, uh, pay isn't everything. So you might be $10,000 short, but can you cover you know, attendance at AFTA? Can you cover some professional development? Can you provide some other um, things that aren't necessarily dollars, but that are still valuable to help close that gap psychologically um, um, for people. So think about think about uh, compensation packages and not just uh, uh, take home pay. And make sure that all of your employees of any age know about the public service loan forgiveness program for their uh, student loan debt. 10 years, if you're working in a nonprofit organization and you make qualifying payments over those 10 years, the government eats the rest of what's left. Lots of people don't know about that. So these, you know, we have to make sure that we're educating ourselves within in this process of how to navigate the system. So um, we're out of time. I wanna thank my fellow panelists, but I also wanna thank you for your time and attention and I hope it was a useful panel for you.